Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Mitch Light of The Athletic, who doubles as the sideline reporter for Vanderbilt Football. We thank our sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. Thank you also to our co-sponsor, The Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. The news presented by our friends at Sutherland and Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland and Belk is committed to fighting for those who have been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. We finally have a date for the Major League Baseball draft. It is going to be June the 10th and 11th. It will be online. And several Vanderbilt players should be picked in that. We will get into a discussion with those with Mitch Light a little bit later. Our guest line on which Mitch appears is presented by Bolin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. Had no clue what I was missing until I got Bolin Branch sheets. They are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but you will not want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Mitch Light of The Athletic joins us as he does every week. Mitch, thank you for joining us today and hope you are doing well. I'm doing fine, Chris. Thank you, sir. How is the workload at The Athletic these days? It's uh, it's steady. Um, I have uh, we've talked several times. I've managed to stay probably almost busier post-pandemic than, uh, than pre. I'm doing a little bit more writing, so that's, key, that's kept me busy. Um, I think last week I, I teased – the uh, James Franklin, Tim Corbin friendship story. Uh, I don't know if you've got a chance to see that, but that took, that was, that kept me busy for a while last week. And then just a lot of, a lot of normal, just draft store post draft. We're doing post draft features on all the Titans draft picks, um, you know, predator stuff. I handle all the grizzly stuff there. So I am, uh, I'm staying busy, which is good because I do not like to be not busy. If I recall when you were at Athlon, this was sort of your downtime of the year. No, the complete opposite, actually. Like April and May were by far the busiest times. We were, if, if under normal circumstances, we would be putting to bed our NFL magazine uh, any day. I think they have delayed those at Athlon because of the pandemic. They're still doing them. And then that's followed by our, our, uh, our I keep saying our, I was there for 18 years. So it's hard going to be a hard habit to kick by the fantasy magazines that were about a week put to bed a week before Memorial Day. So uh, April and May were just, uh, it got, it eased up over the years a little bit as we became more efficient thanks to technology and just other efficiencies and didn't publish as many magazines, but, uh, Springs were always very crazy. Yeah. And then I guess after the NFL stuff was out was when it got easier for you. Yeah. June, you know, June and July were pretty, pretty slow. Well, let's talk about what there is to talk about right now, which I guess the biggest topic is baseball. Of course, there's the start of the major league season, which is still in limbo, but the draft date has been set as most expected. It is going to be five rounds. It is going to be on June the 10th. What are your thoughts on that event? You know, I I think it's probably disappointing for a lot of reasons that it's only five rounds i just i like the draft i like following it it's not great for the players it's not great for anyone i guess except the owners that it's only five rounds less money tied in uh there's gonna be you know these aren't original thoughts but a lot more talent returning to, to college baseball a lot more talent filtering down to junior colleges and a lot of stress for coaches trying to figure out their roster crunch so you know it won't obviously it won't affect the uh uh some of the guys we'll be talking about that the the prime vanderbilt you know Martin, uh, some of the projected first round guys, but the, those fifth through 10th rounders that are, you know, so, so key to the draft and even further down, those guys won't get drafted. And there's going to be cap how much they can make as an undrafted free agent. So it's really going to affect those guys this year. 
I was looking at MLB.com today, and it has updated recently its top 200 for the draft. Of course, I think there's only, what, 161 picks. So these were MLB.com's rankings of the top 200. Austin Martin at 2, Jake Eater at 59, Tyler Brown at 134, Hugh Fisher at 154. Interestingly, no Mason Hickman, no Ethan Smith. In terms of prospects, Robert Hassel at 16, Pete Crow Armstrong at 20. No surprise for either of those. Hassel might even be a couple of spots low, perhaps. Enrique Bradfield at 109, and Bulger, the catcher, who had been a top 200, I think, on some lists at some point, was not in there, too. So your thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, not not a huge surprise. You know, the, the Eater and the Fisher are going to be interesting. Eater's a guy that I, I understand why teams like him and, and could be a top two-round pick. You know, I would have loved – if I'm a major league team, I would have loved to see him complete his junior year to see if he could kind of harness that uh, – uh, that get his control, uh, which was still an issue early this season. So he would, he would scare me a little bit, but not a scout at all. And, and Fisher coming off uh, ACLs, I mean ACL, uh, UCL, Tommy John surgery. Well, we'll see how he comes back and if he comes back. Uh, you know, Tyler Brown. There was talk that he was going to come back, but that's not that's far from certain. I would say the two high school guys, Crow Armstrong and Hassel. You know, uh, pretty much gone, which is no surprise, especially Hassel with that bat. You know, just bats like that are so hard to get through there. So, well, we'll, we'll see. There'll be some interesting uh, guys. I know some guys have hit the transfer portal already, which which will help with roster management. But it's going to be very difficult next year getting down to that number. I was thinking today, if you could only have one of Tyler Brown or Mason Hickman back for next year, if you were Vanderbilt, which one do you take? I think I take Mason Hickman. I think I do too, but man, I, lo- I it's love not easy. starting pitchers. Not 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 that Tyler Brown couldn't be, uh, and they've got Vanderbilt has other options at starting pitcher. But man, if you, it's just it, it's so comforting to to you know, you lighter a year older and rocker with those three. That 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 would be an all time starting starting rotation. Well, it would, but I will throw. Another thing at you here, I mean, Tyler Brown could have started at any point, too, had they not been happy with the other options. Because I'm with you. I usually take a good starter to a good closer, even a great closer, almost all the time. But Brown's a little bit unique in that he could have been that third or second starter, heck, maybe even the first starter on a lot of teams if he was needed. Yeah, and, and Brown was amazing through most of his junior sophomore year. But he wasn't great as a freshman, and he wasn't great this year, too. So <clears throat> there's still a little bit of the unknown with him, in my opinion. Like, I'm not sitting here saying he's not a proven commodity. I just – I'm more – Brown at his best is better than Mason Hickman. But I, I, I would – I like I like Hickman's consistency. The fact that he has started – the fact that he's pitching in the, basically a national championship game. And I love the fact that he showed the mental toughness to – you know, he got hit hard in that first inning, which isn't great, but against Michigan. But if you watch that first inning and then and then tuned in, I guess, college baseball five hours later and saw the final score, you'd be like, either they took him out or something happened. But he just – he righted the ship and showed a lot of fortitude right there, and he was great last year. Yeah, I mean, he is a top-10 starting pitcher in college baseball next year, I assume, if he's back. I think that's the right answer. And your concern on Brown is a great point. Because if Tyler Brown struggles for two or three outings to start the year, okay, that's one thing. But I think he had five, six, seven appearances, and even the ones that were good on the scorecard, he wasn't quite himself. So I do think that's a legit point to bring up. Now, I'm guessing that Tyler Brown would have been okay because when in doubt, I've always bet on that kid, but you never know. Yeah, and again, like he's a great at his best, he's a great pitcher. Um, I'm just, he had one great year. He had a good freshman year, not a great freshman year. And then his, if you didn't know who he was, you wouldn't have thought much of his performance this junior year. We all, you know, lost two in the opening weekend, lost two one run games. And, you know, I believe he blew the save in both of them. So, uh, again, great pitcher. I'd take Hickman. I think Tyler and boy, you talk about a kid who has just faced adversity at every turn. This is the worst possible year 
for something like that to happen with Tyler Brown because there's been some talk that teams might just punt on picks because of the money. I mean, here you've got a guy who has got a child to raise, you know, has lost all the things in his life that he's lost, couldn't be in a great financial position to begin with, don't know what kind of scholarship he's on if he returns. I mean, I would presume he's going to be paying some out of his own pocket. So I hope things work out for him because I feel badly for him. It's just like, just when you think another thing can't (laughs) go wrong for him, this draft thing happens right at the year that he would normally come out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if he's, if he's as good as we hope he is down the road, it's not really going to matter. He'll get the, uh, He'll get paid eventually, but it would have been nice to, you know, if, if he had another great year coming off in normal circumstances and be a top two round pick, obviously the money would be really good there. The consensus right now, well, it's not a consensus, but I was reading some stuff last week. I don't remember if it was The Athletic or someone else, and I apologize for not giving credit where it's due, but someone had surveyed, I think, about 30 scouts within MLB organizations, and it was, the question was, because this is the debate right now, do you take Spencer Torkelson at Arizona State, number one overall if you're the Tigers, or do you take Austin Martin? Those are the two players in the running. Asa Lasa was getting some run, but I think he's kind of a, maybe, I don't know if it's a distant third, but certainly most people don't think he's one of the two options. So I think what I read, 25 of the people surveyed of the scouts said they'd take Torkelson over Martin. Have you followed Torkelson enough to have an opinion on that? No, I, I haven't. I mean, I, I, I know of him. I know his stats. So I can sit here and say I think Austin Martin should be the number one pick, but I, I can't tell you I've watched much of Torkelson or do I necessarily watch the game as a scout. All I'll say is I've watched a lot of Vanderbilt baseball over the last 15 years, and I think Austin Martin's the best hitter that Vanderbilt has had as far as just making solid contact, athleticism, versatility. I think he's up there, probably the number one player. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, you, you, you can't go wrong with Austin Martin, in my opinion. He's a surefire major leaguer. Torkelson has the power Martin we think would have developed shown more power this year. So I'd love to see Austin Martin go number one, but I I can't sit here and say that I think he should definitely be picked over Torkelson. Let's switch gears a minute to football. Jim Harbaugh wrote a letter and I found out about this today. I got asked on air about it yesterday, but I had not read it. And within it, basically he asked the NCAA to consider letting kids return to school If they weren't taken in the NFL draft, do you have any thoughts on that topic? Because it's like college basketball. Those guys can go into the draft. They don't get drafted, and they can come back. But football doesn't have that rule. Yeah, in theory, it seems like it's a good idea, and I haven't really thought about it a ton. The first thing that pops in my head is, what about the kid who's, you know, not Mr. Okay, Mr. Relevant, or he's taken late in the seventh round. It's not a good fit. He doesn't want, you know, he's for whatever reasons, he's an offensive lineman, and that team's got. 10 deep at that position. So he can't go back, but the guy who's not drafted, you know, who's basically the same player as him, but just wasn't picked in the last three or four spots can go back. That's the only thing that's going to be a little unfair to the guys who actually are drafted. Uh, Maybe there's something like hockey where you can go back to school and that school, that that team retains your rights. Um, I like, I might be in favor of that model, uh, NFL, I don't know if that would work. It'd be a certain round. Like you don't want a situation because NFL teams in the first, probably what do you think? Three or four rounds, they're drafting guys to be immediate contributors. So you don't want a situation where an NFL team takes a cornerback in the fourth round and they take him because they need him to come play right away. And he says, I want to go back to school for a year. And then they're without that player. So I don't know if that makes sense. I'm just kind of thinking that as I go along here, I I'm in favor of that model in principle, but it just, you, you got to be sure you think everything through. It's always struck me as inconsistent. The NCAA has said it's in the business of education. Of course it is. But if that is really what you think, I have never understood not letting a kid return to school when he's getting a full scholarship if he can't go make it at that level right away. It just seems to me that you're setting a kid more up for failure because he can't go right into employment as he planned, but now his free ride is gone too. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I'm trying to think of reasons why 
you shouldn't allow it if you don't, you know, there's different eight now in basketball, there's certified agents, there's agents who aren't certified. If you're worried about that, maybe if you don't sign with an agent, you can come back. There's ways around it. So I, I agree in theory. Well, and then there's baseball where you can do just about whatever other than sign with an agent and still come back. Well, and then there's hockey where you can go for one year, two years, three years. You can leave college whenever you want. I know the Predators right now, one of their, their, one of their top draft picks from last couple of years ago was at BU, Boston University, and they wanted him to basically sign this year, but he wanted to go play his senior year. Uh, so there's an issue there, but it's not like in football when you are – your top prospects, your top draft picks, you need to play right away. Hockey, no others. Basketball is like that. Hockey and baseball are not like that. You know, the Tigers aren't going to draft Austin Martin to play second base or center field next year. And same same thing in hockey. There's obviously the minor league development. I've never really given this much thought. I don't know if you have, but why is it so different in the different sports in terms of how the NCAA treats these kids? Just the I, I, I Good question. The, the nature of the sport, you know, I think football has been done to protect them from because physically it's not it doesn't really make sense for kids to go out of high school. Um, baseball's had the it seems like baseball's just kind of had the rule forever or as long as I can remember. And it just it seems to work with all parties. So why rock the boat? Same thing with hockey. I, I don't follow hockey that closely, but I think both both sides like the way it is. I think basketball is the one that where it seems like seeming like almost no one's happy with the way it is, and that's why maybe it changes so much. Well, and baseball is just a weird animal because you remember back to when I started covering baseball and you started following Tim Corbin. Back at that time, you could transfer schools without penalty. You didn't have to sit out. I remember one year Vanderbilt landed Brian Hernandez from Duke. He came right over and became their catcher. And baseball used to have all sorts of freedom all the way around. Yeah, well, it looks like it's going to happen again, too. You know, it, probably not this year, but for the 21 academic year where you can have that one-time transfer rule, which we've talked about. I don't love it in baseball. You know, the rich are going to get richer. Let's say Vanderbilt needs a third baseman one year. Someone leaves and someone gets and the, someone gets hurt. You know, it's not like it's tampering. But I, I'm sure that year it got out that Vanderbilt was weak at catcher and Brian Hernandez was like, hmm. I played against that Tim Corbin guy, Clemson or whatever, and they need a catcher. I'm transferring to Vanderbilt. You know, you know. The, again, not saying there's tampering, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy to figure out where teams have weak points and stuff. So I, I'm not in love with the one-time tr- transfer allowing, but that's that's another topic. Um, but yeah, I, I totally remember when I was in college. Uh, Charlie Sullivan transferred from Duke to to Vanderbilt and was starting second baseman. Um, so. Uh, it was just you could kind of survey the landscape and what Ryan Klosterman came with Corbin played right away at shortstop. Well, and then they had the reverse. This was before Corbin, but they lost Mark Pryor, who was, I guess, the best college pitcher in the game, at least when he left Southern Cal. But Vanderbilt had him for a year, and then he went to USC. Yep, and um, I'm sure you've heard this story. I don't know if all of our listeners have, but Corbin knew uh, Mark Pryor from Team USA and reached out to him when he was considering coming to Vanderbilt and asked Pryor said, do you think you can win at Vanderbilt? And Pryor evidently gave him the answers he was looking for and said, yeah, he thinks he can win there. He thinks you can win there. So that was, I don't know if, if, if Corbin was going to make his decision solely on what a, at the time, 21 year old kid said, but uh, uh, Pryor, even though he left Vanderbilt, I think one of his, I think his mom went to Vanderbilt. There, there was a connection there because he was a, he was he was an enormous recruit when he when he came to Vanderbilt. He was he wasn't just one of these guys who got good once he got to college. He was he was a top high school player. Yeah, I guess that was you know we talk about the Worth Scott home run. I guess if you really want to go back a little bit further, I hadn't thought about this till now. But that was maybe just the first little seed of what Vanderbilt baseball could be when they got prior. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, there was a connect. I, his mom went to Van. I, we I remember covering that. That's when uh, I was doing the Commodore Report, and I remember talking to him in high school. Maybe one of his parents in there. You know, he's from California. It, sure, it 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 was a great get, but if his mom didn't go to Vanderbilt, you know, Vanderbilt probably wouldn't have been wouldn't have been in the picture. But yeah, and, and they they had gotten, you know, Clinton Johnson before that was a first round pick. He was a big recruit. That was the thing about the Mewburn era. They, there were some high-end players and first-round picks. It was just the the lack of overall ro- roster depth, and obviously Jeremy Sowers was another one. Yeah, that's true. They did get some players. They just seem would seem to get, and I didn't follow it closely then, but like you said, some really good ones. But then 
lineup depth uh, fell off pretty precipitously as did pitching depth after your your few studs. Yeah, you know, Josh Paul was a first round pick. Again, Clinton Johnson was a first round pick. Uh, there was in in the late nineties, I think Vanderbilt had three first round picks in about a four or five year period. You know, I really go back to when things started to change for Vanderbilt baseball, which I would pinpoint around the turn of the Tallahassee Regional. Of course, you had 2007, which was great in its own right. But really, from that regional on, the program took a marked upward turn. You had the blips and at the end of 2016 through the end of 2018. We all know the reasons for that. But I look back at that, and really one of the differences was roster depth. And you and I have commented on this in recent years that Vanderbilt Corbin's best teams, you know, or his teams, I guess, his first decade there, were they had a lot of good players or or a few great players and some good ones. But once you got past maybe players 13, 14 on the roster – it started to drop off. I think when they really became a national power, the difference was you get to players 20, 21, 22, 23 before you really start to see a drop off. Yeah, totally. And I think the past, I don't know, eight, 10 years, everyone in their roster, you know, you take the bottom five pitchers and the bottom five position players would be top half players, almost not almost not any school, not the Floridas or some of the top level SEC teams, of course, but uh, w- would be prominent players in almost any program. There's really very few weaknesses. Sometimes, you, you know, even this year, having trouble identifying, solidifying outfield spots. It wasn't for a lack of talent. It was more a lack of just experience and, and guys settling into their role. I, I've told this, I probably said this to you on the podcast, but I I mean, was it the two that the, the Tallahassee Super Regional that you're talking about that um, one of the Florida State writers that I dealt with at Athlon a lot knew I went to Vanderbilt and that I followed the program. And he, even though Florida State won that regional, he just he reached out to me afterwards. He's like that the Florida State people were just blown away with the quality of pitching at, at Vanderbilt. And then we saw that the, the next year that that team, you know, obviously goes to the College World Series. Yeah, that 2010 team was a pretty underrated bunch, I think. They went 46 and 20 and. They lost game three in Tallahassee, where it was about 139 degrees down there, nine to eight. And I really watched that thinking maybe the better team had lost that super. Yeah, I remember that for a lot of uh, reasons. I was uh, at my in-laws in Michigan, and um, my wife grew up on a farm and an organic farm outside of Battle Creek and put it this way. It wasn't, I didn't love going up to the farm. It was always a hundred degrees in the summer and they didn't have cable and Vanderbilt was playing game three of the super regional and her, her brother lived in, in town in Battle Creek and had a nice house and like air conditioning and cable TV. So I remember just going and sitting upstairs in his, his bonus room for four hours watching that game. And I think there's a rain delay watching that game. My kids were younger too. So I had no kids, no in-laws, I think I got a pizza and maybe some frosty cold beverages just watching that game by myself. So even though the Commodores lost, it was it was a glorious afternoon. How much did you ponder falling off the grid for good at that point? <laughs> uh, well, I felt like I was off the grid when I was on the farm. Again, no cable, no internet back then, no nothing. So uh, yeah, I was. Uh, uh, now when we go up there, we stay at the brother's house. We don't we don't stay at the farm. So I feel like I'm in c- civilization at least. <laughs> right. Well, one thing we talk every week is the Vandy Sports 100. You follow it, and I have I sent you the list before I did this. I, I sent it to you, the updates, periodically. I think you follow it online. One of the discussions you and I had was Festus Azili and Luke Cornett. I had Azili at 49 in my countdown, Cornett at 50. And I originally had him flipped. You talked me into putting Azili ahead of Cornette, even though I think Azili played about 900 fewer minutes at Vandy and didn't do some things as well as Cornette. Uh, assist to turnover ratio was markedly different from the two. Azili turned it over. Cornette uh, didn't as much and could pass the ball a little bit, whereas Azili couldn't at all. Uh, but you can, felt, can I interrupt you? I want to interrupt yeah. you. My favorite, one of my favorite Kevin songs is at practice once and I – again, if you've heard this story on this podcast, I apologize. But I was at practice once, and Stallings – blows the whistle and he goes Festus under no condition under no circumstance is our offense better when you decide to dribble the ball 
and just blew the whistle, <laughs> and, and then they just went back and, and, and kept practicing. Can you imagine if somebody said that to Simi Chateau? Uh, n- no. <laughs> the, the, pro- the problem is no one did say that to Simi Chateau. Uh, bingo. But uh, back to Azili and Cornette. When I posted it on the board, I got feedback both ways. People had strong opinions that Cornette was the better player. People had strong opinions that Azili was the better player. Um, I, I guess my opinion, when everything settles, is I'm still torn. I, I, again, I my inclination was to go with Cornette. I deferred to your judgment on this one. I don't think I'm way wrong either way. But what's your case for taking Azili over Cornette? Um, not that strong because, you know, I often joke and I think you agree. And I, I say this on the pod every week when I have doing lists and rankings at, at Athlon all those years, sometimes it depends on what time I start and what kind of mood I'm in and stuff. Like, cause if you would have asked me who, like, who I like, who I would rank higher, like one day I might say Cornette, one day I might say Azili. I remember making the Azili argument. I just thought, you know, he played on better teams for the most part. Um, I just felt just thinking back anecdotally that Azili was a more dominant college basketball player. Um, again, without even looking at the numbers, just a focal point of the offense, even though he was on a talented team, uh, more of a low post score. Now, obviously it wasn't a three point shooter. So I, 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 they're very, very rational arguments for Cornette as well. That's why they're ranked so close. And that's why you who dove into the numbers can't even, um, you know, can't even, uh, is having a difficult time separating the two. I just, uh, you know, I, I thought Azili was just a slightly better college basketball player, but Luke Cornett's one of my favorite college basketball players, great dude. And so n- no argument either way. Well, I don't really reward players a ton for stat compiling. What I mean by stat compiling is just putting up numbers because you play basically. And Azili got denied some of the stat compilation phase of his career because he was behind A.J. Ogilvy for two years. Whereas with Cornette, it was the opposite thing. He really Here's, needed a redshirt that first year, but they just didn't have enough depth on the roster. So that was another odd thing about that situation, is those two kids were both sort of projects coming in, but they came in under totally opposite circumstances. Right, and you know, Azili got hurt his senior year, did not play at the beginning, so really did not have, never, you know, only averaged 10 points a game. His 10 and... 10 and six is his, his junior year was his best year, 13 and six, um, 58% from the field, uh, did not attempt a three point shot in his career. Um, and ended up being a decent free throw shooter shot 65% his last two 65 and then 60%. So not great, but I remember hitting some clutch ones. So, you know, I'd have to look at the numbers Cornette maybe, um, you know, I would say the way the game is played now, Cornette's more valuable player, just his versatility offensively, um, than Azili, who was clearly just a low post threat. So two of my favorite Vanderbilt basketball players ever. And so I, I, again, good, really good arguments for both players. Well, Cornette was also hurt his senior year and I don't know how to compare the two injuries. I mean, Azili's knees bothered him, you know, really from Vanderbilt on and forced his retirement, whether it's whereas Cornette's, I guess, didn't linger too long. I don't think it's hampered him in the pros at all. But I don't know how similar the situations were. Azili had the luxury of playing on a great team that senior year, at least in terms of talent. And Cornette, on the other hand, that team just couldn't do without him. I don't know how much Luke had to play through that injury as a senior because the team didn't have other options. Uh, But that's an interesting thought, too. Yeah. Uh, I agree, and I think we can all we can all agree too that you know, not starting a big discussion here. That Kevin Stallings a better offensive coach than Bryce Drew. Like to think that if if Kevin would have coached Cornette his last year, maybe even done some really you know better things with him and and gotten him more shots in better locations. I know he had a good senior year, so uh, interesting. You know, they both had that that. I was at Cornette's junior year where that team was stalling last year. That team is really talented and underachieved in the regular season than, than, than squeezing the NCAA tournament. Um, so just a, a unique player who's not as unique as he was, you know, that, that type of player we see more and more of them, but still, I, I, you know, he's not, he's not six, nine who can shoot. He was seven feet, seven, one who could shoot from the outside. Well, every week we do this, we go through some of the recent players that 
we have honored in the Vandy Sports 100. And if you haven't followed it, we have a list where we count down to number one from 100 of the 100 greatest players that I have covered, which started in 2003. And I'm going to read you 47 through 60. I don't think we've discussed any of these on the podcast except for the two we just went over. And I'll let you pick if there's something about the ranking that sticks out that you think I got wrong or something interesting about the player. You can just pick the topic, but I will read the players and let you choose from here. Number 47, Kyle Shermer. 48, Andre Howell. 49 and 50 were Zeely and Cornette. Uh, 51, Ethan Paul. 52, Steven Scott. 53, Patrick Raby. 54, Jason Esposito. 55, Ralph Webb. 56, Kenny Ladler. 57, uh, I cannot read my own writing here. 58, Harrell. That's Connor <laughs> Harrell. 59, <laughs> Rhett Wiseman. And 60, Mike Yastrzemski. Actually, at 57, I have written down as Williams. Oh, that's Jawan Williams. I could yeah. not remember which Williams. I'm like, I know it's not Chris. But so that's that settles the mystery of 58. But anything in those rankings that you have a disagreement with or any of those players you think is just worth the discussion right now? Say Ladler and how? When did Ladler play? Ladler played. He played for Franklin, right? Yeah, I believe he was ten to thirteen. And yeah. I think Hal was the same four years. Yeah. So it got me because I talked to um, for that story I did on James Franklin and Tim Corbin. I talked to a lot of coaches. I talked to Bob Shoot um, for the story, and then we were just talking. And you know, he's he said to me, he said, you know, I've said this many times before. You know, I think Coach Franklin, our staff did a great job that year, but we had some we had some players. We we walked into a good situation, you know, especially defensively with Casey Hayward. He singled out Kenny Ladler and How, some of the young some of the guys in the defensive line there. So I think people kind of forget that um, there there was some talent there. And Andre Howe, I think two interceptions against Tennessee as a senior and had a really nice career and, and, and was a, I remember, I actually just remember when he signed, seemed like, or committed, seemed like a good, good commit there. So I thought he was a really good player. I, I kind of am a little impartial to the, you know, Connor Harrell's and Yaz's uh, of the world, just four year baseball players. Harrell was, correct me if I'm wrong, I think was a pretty big recruit relatively early in the Corbin era and had a good career. Not, I mean, very good career. Obviously if he's on the list, this list, um, had some holes in the swing, struck out a lot, but a great defensive player. And then Yaz, I think, will be remembered as an all-time great at Vanderbilt. Um, so, yeah, some some really good players. Jawan Williams, we've talked about before. I would have had him a little bit higher. Um, I just thought his junior year, he was, you know, had one of the best seasons for a Vanderbilt football player in a while. Wasn't great as a freshman, uh, solid as a sophomore, but, you know, obviously a really good player in second round draft. Second round pick, I think, New England. So, yeah, some really good names. Ralph Webb. You know, one one of the better, better offensive players variables had a, a, a durable player in football. That's one of the compliments you can give a guy is, you know, he, he rarely missed time. He was banged up a lot. And another thing Bob Shoup told me that when Shoup was at Tennessee, the Tennessee guys told him, his defensive players told him that Ralph Webb was one of the hardest running backs in the league, one of the hardest guys to tackle, one of the most, you know, hardest working, physical, all that stuff. You brought up an interesting point with Yastrzemski and Harrell, and I agree with you. Those guys had really good careers. Where you struggle to rank guys like this in baseball is this. You have three different scenarios, right? You have the rare one where you will have a Philip Clark or a Pat DeMarco who are draft-eligible sophomores. And so if you're good enough to get drafted as a sophomore and go, that says something about you as a quality of a player. On the other hand... You have guys like Harold and Yastrzemski who got another year to have maybe their best seasons at Vanderbilt that uh, not only do a DeMarco and a Clark not get those extra two years, but most of your players who are great college baseball players stay three years. So weighing that, trying not to be unfair to the guys that were two-year players, but trying not to weigh too much the four-year guys when – Truth is, if they were a little bit better players, they would have gone after that third year. That was really hard to decide on what to do with those groups of kids. Yeah, it's an impossible argue, impossible thing to do. Like, how, how do you judge Harry Ray's contributions versus – and he's maybe not the best, best example. The guys you were talking about, Harold and Yaz, pretty much four-year starters. 
against the two year guy. Um, so it's it, 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 guys are remembered differently. Harrison Ray will be, re- assuming he doesn't come back, will be remembered as a very popular player, all time, you know, not all time great, but just one of the more popular guys. And he was on the national championship team. But he was he a great college player? No, he's a good college player. Certainly, there's been better college players at Vanderbilt that have played only two years, and there was two of his teammates last year. So I agree, very difficult to judge to to weigh those those two very different types of careers. I got a little blowback on having Webb too low, and I don't I don't ever want to slight that guy because man, he got the most out of his career. He was tough. He played banged up. There was nothing that you could say about Ralph Webb in his career except something that was admirable. That's poorly phrased, but I think you know what I mean. But Webb, to me, was a little bit of a stat compiler. He didn't play, for the most part, on good teams. Like, if if he's on a team with Keyshawn Vaughn or he's on a team with Zach Stacey, I think both of us would agree easily, though we're better players, so... Webb doesn't play as much in that circumstances and doesn't become Vandy's all-time leading rusher. But obviously, when a guy is, what, I think the sixth all-time leading rusher in the SEC, however you get there, that means something too. So that was a little bit of a tough one and a divisive one, but for reasons that I completely understand. No, I agree with you. And I, I think the world of Ralph Webb, like I said, hard worker, respected by teammates and opposition the way I always looked at Ralph Webb was do opposing defensive coordinators worry about Ralph Webb beating them? I would say no. Opposing defensive coordinators are worried about Zach Stacy, Keyshawn Vaughn. And it's sort of like the circumstances. Like you said, if he came two years earlier or two years later, he would not have bought all those yards because he wouldn't have been the primary back for all four years. Uh, Tennessee is a good example. They've had so many good running backs that they're, they're leading rushers career wise aren't really they don't have gaudy stats because no one is the primary ball carrier for three years or if they were like Jamal Lewis he gets hurt like who is it was a Jalen Hurd I was shocked he was so high up on the Tennessee all-time ranks but then you look it's because guys they have so many good running backs you just kind of like wait your turn you're only a lead runner for one year or two years um so I think you know it was Ralph was a very good player and played in kind of a sweet spot where there were no other marquee, you know, running backs uh, for him to compete with carry, for carries with. Well, and I think if Ralph had gone to the NFL and made a roster and gotten some carries as a rookie, I might have regarded him a little bit higher. I would have said, well, he was good enough to make the league. That was a case where he had a chance to maybe help himself a few spots. Again, this is about your career at Vanderbilt and what you do, but I also use that as a little bit of a tiebreaker if I have some doubts. So the fact that he didn't do that – I don't want to say I held it against him, but he missed a chance to boost his case a little bit that way. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a different way to, ju- you know, if you're going to give a guy a boost, begin makes the NFL. But again, just looking from a college running back, really good player, not a great player. Well, and the place I use that the most is on linemen because linemen don't really compile numbers and they're just hard to judge. Right. So I was with you there, yes. Yeah, because like Spencer Pulley is the – penultimate example I don't think I would ever in a million years thought about putting Spencer Pulley in the top 100 but he goes and makes the NFL and is a starter for a couple of years to say huh and then I go back and look at his stuff that's when pro football focus started to track players and so I looked him up they rated him very highly at Vanderbilt so that was one case where that's where that got a guy on my radar that would not have been there otherwise. I think I had Pulley in the 90s somewhere. One last one, Patrick Raby was a really divisive pick at 53. He had one great year as a sophomore. He had an excellent freshman year. In fact, he was he was great. He just didn't pitch. I think he threw about 60 innings, so the volume of work wasn't there, but the work itself was terrific. The last two years... Raby just wasn't dependable in SEC play, but the crazy thing about him is he just kept getting out of jams, whether it was his own doing or he would leave two or three guys on and the bullpen would get him out of it. On one hand, like, he didn't pitch well enough to stay in the rotation, and I think, like, down the stretch of last year, we're all kind of watching thinking, man, they need to make a change in the rotation and get Hickman in there which is what they did. But on the other hand, statistically speaking, he never really hurt. I didn't realize this. His highest ERA in any SEC regular season was 388. So 
even when Patrick Raby, quote-unquote, hurt you, he really didn't. And that made him a really interesting case. That and the fact that he's the all-time wins leader at Vanderbilt. Now, again, that's a product of being there four years, but you think of all the great pitchers they've had, and Patrick Raby is the all-time wins leader. That was a really strange resume to try to break down. Yeah, that's surprising that his ERA was not higher than that in the SEC season. He would have been an interesting, more interesting to evaluate, probably would be remembered more fondly, is if his sophomore year was his senior year. If he just gradually, you know, kind of was a – okay pitcher and then had a great senior year like he had sophomore year it's just puzzling because he was so good as a sophomore for what happened so yeah i'm with you without having compared too much to other people he he's a very difficult guy he had some great performances i think you know, beat florida once a sophomore year 2-1 or 1-0 or something like that at vanderbilt or 3-1 just had some great performances his sophomore year and just for whatever reason just could not could not find that consistency or that dominance his last two years. Yeah, I think I made that same point in the article. I said that if you just rearrange Patrick Raby's seasons, then he's probably viewed differently. In other words, if you make his sophomore year his senior year, then everybody's saying, oh, he definitely belonged there. But we tend to remember what we see last, and I think that was one of the biggest things against him. Okay, I've got some questions in the mailbag. Let's grab those quickly. The mailbag is sponsored by Mark Gent of Simply a Fan. Mark organizes road trips to sporting events across the country and is doing so for several Vanderbilt baseball road series, uh, probably next year. Uh, That was in the plan for this year, but of course baseball didn't happen. Go to Simply a Fan to get more information. Tell them you heard about it on this podcast. Five Star Door says, does the recruiting class for this year's football class and for 21, how does that compare to Mason's previous classes? Better talent overall, better lineman. Is there more size or speed? Um, I will defer to you. Don't follow recruiting that closely uh, to know, especially, you know, as it's going on, you know, uh, comparing class. I I can look at the numbers comparing classes, you know, go to 247, which I like to do, and, you know, compare classes uh, to each other and stuff. But but, uh, a current crop. Um, you know, I, I'll defer to you on that, Chris. Uh, what I always say is most Vanderbilt recruiting classes, other than maybe one or two of, J- of James Franklin's that ended up having a lot of busts in it, most Vanderbilt recruiting classes all end up looking the same, whether they're Bobby Johnson or, or, or Derek Mason. They're all kind of in that same range, and it's just whether or not uh, whether or not you, you hit on uh, enough guys. Like, like I said, I'm sure that I'd have to go back and look, but some of those classes that yielded guys like Andre Hal and, and Ladler and who ended up playing the NFL probably weren't ranked any higher than some other or, or lower than some other ones. I know it's kind of a boring answer. Well, I agree with you. I'm not even going to begin to try to rank linemen. I just think that's hard to judge. Usually they don't start contributing till their second, third year on campus at the earliest anyway. So that's a crapshoot as it is. I mean, I think it's about the same as what he's had. The wild card is the quarterbacks, because if you hit big with the quarterback, that can change the trajectory of the program. So I would say this is sort of average with sort of a bullet attached to it, because I really liked the Wright and Seals signing, and both the Juco kids made sense for obvious reasons too, and that they turn over the entire quarterbacking roster. Yeah. Okay. So he's talking. Sorry. Maybe the 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 class that's already signed. Um, that that's what he meant. Oh, well, can, yeah. I think well, I think he did. Now that I think about, it, I was thinking he meant the one they just signed. Well, look. I mean, those two classes are so preliminary in formation. They've got what three or four commits right now. I mean, it's yeah. just it's too early to tell. That's, so I can speak to that one a little bit more because I did I did a little bit of research for the, the uh, my my. We call it state of the program. It was up on the athletic last Saturday. You can find it at uh, just go to the athletic, the Nashville page or the Vanderbilt football page. It's up there, and um, you know I, I made the point that I just kind of made that they. It's a little bit of a. I said James Franklin did recruit better, but it's a little bit of a myth. Um, I forgot how I phrased it. Only one of Franklin's classes was top a oh, top forty class, and that was his last one. It ended up having a lot of busts in it. Um, I said the problem at Vanderbilt recently would, would, is the quarterback position, which you mentioned, three straight years. And it didn't hurt him until this past year because Kyle Shermer was a three-and-a-half-year starter. But three years in a row, you get Jacob Free, who leaves after one semester. You get um, 
um, Alan Walters, who's a bust and somehow gets a scholarship to Mississippi State, and then you get Jamil Muhammad, who doesn't even enroll. So it's three straight years in an era when most times you don't sign more than one quarterback where you got nothing from the quarterback recruits uh, from high school. And that comes back to bite you. How's it come back to bite you? Well, last year you got to go in a, the, the, the grad transfer route that obviously didn't work out very well. Um, so I think they, they did a a good job. I think that the two quarterbacks were two of the top four signees that they had this year, but they're going to, they're going to be true freshmen, you know? So, um, I, it looked like the top end of this class is, um, was pretty good. Another recruiting note. Again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Mason's best class by far was the one with Walters in it. And of that class, the top the, the top 10 guys by uh, ranking, Cam Johnson is the only pretty much guaranteed guy to start this year. So um, Alston Orgy was was the number one recruit. He has not made he has not played a meaningful down on defense yet. So it's on paper. That's Franklin's best. Cl- I mean, Mason's best class. But again, only one of the top 10 guys is a definite starter this year. That's that's kind of a problem. Well, if you can't start this year, then it's kind of a when can you start. So that's a very bad sign. I mean, yeah, there's some guys like Dan Dawkins who will probably start or be a key guy, right? But uh, there's some guys that will be in the mix. But I'm just when you're doing your when you're doing your starting lineup, you're like Cam Johnson is a no doubt about it starter. Yeah, a lot of these guys would not have been in the mix two or three years ago for sure, and that's the issue. This one's going to be tough to answer because so much of the staff has turned over. I don't think we have a big body of work to judge them on yet by the way I was doing the Lindy's preview last night and submitting that uh, for the Vanderbilt preview for their football magazine this year and Mason has now turned over with the firing of Godowski every coach on his original staff I guess it's not unusual but just as a point of fact by the way frankly just and I know I've mentioned his name a lot more just because I talked to him last week but but for those who haven't followed, Brent Pry is the only member of James Franklin's original staff that is still on board uh, now that Sean Spencer left and Ricky Ron- Rick Sean Spencer's with the Giants and Ricky Ryan's the head coach at ODU. So, um, and, and obviously in the same time span, uh, and Brent Pry's a defensive coordinator there, will probably be a head coach pretty soon. Yeah, I don't know that it's that unusual in some ways. No, I think the coordinator turnover, you tell me. Four years or four coordinators on each side of the ball. Of course, Mason counts is one of his own coordinators. Is that unusual turnover? That's high. It's yeah. and I follow this up pretty closely. That's a bit high, not not absurdly high, uh, but I think the fact that he swung and missed on the the first year on both sides of the ball. So basically, there was you know if you felt like the term year zero, there was a, basically a reset there. So that that that's a bit high. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Five star door wanted to know who's made the biggest impact in identifying and recruiting kids to Nashville. Do uh, you have any opinions on that? No, I don't follow recruiting close enough to know um, basically who the best, you know, I could pay, you know, see who the top recruiter and the top players, but no, I'm, I'm not the person to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, so many of these guys just hadn't been there long enough. Uh, Matty Oli's identified some kids from them in the past, and he's been there a while. Tim Horton was pretty good at his past stops. So he's a guy that, that had some reputation for that, I think a little bit too. I mean, that's, that's my best guess, but another one from five star door. When other schools are using negative recruiting against kids, Vanderbilt's after what kind of stuff do they say? And is it effective? I can't speak to how effective it is. I mean, uh, some of the obvious ones are probably, you know, you hear over the years, school's too hard. Why, why go there? Um, I'm sure for football, you know, crowd support factors in. Um, so, you, you know, so I, I can't speak to how impactful it is. Um, some kids pick Vanderbilt for certain reasons. Some pick them for, you know, don't pick them for those reasons. So it's, you know, I, I think there's negative recruiting that goes along. I, it, the one thing that could really backfire, telling kids that it's too hard academically like the, telling that to the wrong kid could really backfire. You're like, what, coach, you don't think I'm smart enough? Or, you know, it, it all depends on how you take it. Um, and then if you say that in front of the parents, you're like, oh, so he just should go to your school and he won't have to work hard? You know, there's a lot of different ways to spin that one. Yeah, if I'm a parent and that's said in front of my kid, I think they get crossed off my list immediately. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, there's, again, there's what, you can spin it as in, oh, 
he's just doesn't not going to get an education at your school and you don't think he's smart enough to do the work. You know, there's a lot of different ways. Yeah, that that comes across as an insult if if I'm the one hearing yeah. it. But this last question, believe it or not, from Five Star Door, going into 2020, how does the roster compare to 2018 and 2019? Which ones look better or worse? I, I think you have to start the quarterback position, and that's the problem. Um, in 2018, you had a you had a quarterback that you knew was going to be a top flight SEC quarterback, and and now you, 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 it's a big unknown. Uh, beyond that, I think I like the I I don't have the you know the depth chart in front of me. I have to go look at 2018. I think this defense has a chance to be much better this year. Uh, uh, veteran defense, there's a chance to be better than that defense. Um, but offensively, we didn't know 2018. You didn't know that Jared Pinckney was going to take a jump. That's the year it took a jump. You didn't know Keyshawn Vaughn. We really didn't know what what they had in him until midseason there. So there was a lot of unknowns that year as well. I just think it's the quarterback position. Can Brooks or Wakefield be a you know anything more than a um, a league average at best running back, you know, that can, can you get a difference maker there? Um, I, I like uh, Fitch as offense coordinator, talk to him. I, I, mean, I like what they're going to try and do there, but with such uncertainty at the quarterback position, I'd say on paper, it's hard to rank this roster higher than those two. The 2018 roster is the clear winner in my mind, just for offense alone, because you look back at that bunch, they had school at left tackle, they had Bruno Reagan at right guard, they had Devin Cochran on that team starting at tackle, Kyle Schirmer was your quarterback, Keyshawn Vaughn was a tailback, you had Pinckney and Lipscomb having their prime years, you had Cam Johnson starting the year as a contributor before he got hurt, you had some other quality guys out there who could play a little bit. I just think that you compare that offense – to this one, it's no contest. And I think that was a historically good offense in terms of talent level for Vanderbilt. Right. I, my And I agree with you. My point was, <coughs> excuse me, was at this point, though, we didn't quite know what yet. Because, again, Pinckney had been a disappointment. We knew Lipscomb was going to be pretty good. There were still more uncertainties. Um, at, at this point, heading into 2018, you know, school was good. Reagan was good. You knew there were some good guys in the offensive line. So I, I would agree in 2018, even at this point, that, that roster looked better. Well, last thing, and we'll go, this year's roster has got just problems everywhere. You mentioned the quarterback situation. The offensive line last year, pro football focus, rated 128 of 130 in the FBS. And you digged in on that a little bit, and then Devin Cochran, who was their best lineman, is now at Georgia Tech, so that's an issue. Uh, I mean, so that's that's a really scary picture, a true freshman quarterback and a bad offensive line. You know, you said if Wakefield could be league average, then that you know that that would be good. That that would be a monumental overachievement in my mind. Now, I think at receiver, Cam Johnson, Amir Abdul Rahman, Ben Bresnahan, that's a pretty good threesome potentially. A pass catchers, but again, go back to quarterback. Which, no offense to Seals. But he's young, and he's not going to have much blocking. So that's an issue. The defensive side of the ball, they're very experienced. They're going to be better just because of that. But just no stars that are easily identifiable. And that's one of the bigger problems on the roster. As I was doing this for Lindy's last night, they asked me to pick an MVP. And I had one in mind, and I called my buddy Seabass, and he was kind of stumped too. Eventually, I settled on Dimitri Moore just because he's getting so much run in the draft. But – I mean, usually, even on just terrible Vanderbilt teams, you could pick somebody that, that there was always a star or a superstar somewhere. This year, I don't think they even have that, at least not yet. Maybe after the season, that's played out differently. But heading into 2020, I don't ever remember a year where it was as difficult to identify a star on this team heading into the season as it is this one. Well, I think the defensive line will be considerably – there's better players across the board on the defensive line. I think that will help. Um, and I, I agree with that there, there have been – usually, again, even when I was in college, and so there was – going back to Damon Winston, who was a draft pick of the Saints, there's always been star power heading into a season. Um, so maybe this team has a little bit more overall roster depth. I'm not saying they do, but you're right. On paper, it's hard. You know, Dio Dingbo would be a guy that has all-conference ability. If I was looking for – you know, all conference guys possibly would be uh, Dingbo, Dimitri Moore, um, K- 
Cam Johnson. I really like Brent Bresnahan too. I think they like him. They're going to use him well, use him in, in good spots there. So uh, th- those would probably be uh, the, the top end guys um, just off the top of my head. Well, in my mind, you just named their best three players. It's it's between Odingbo, Moore, and Cam Johnson. I don't know what the right order is, but those are the three guys that I was thinking of too. Yeah, and uh, I, I think there's good depth in the secondary. I don't know if it's talent. There's a, there's a lot of experience in the secondary, put it that way. They're, they're, they're not lacking there uh, between – especially there's a lot of cornerbacks who played a lot of snaps. They need a couple guys to really emerge and, and seize that – uh, position, you know, late last year that, that, that happened. So, um, again, I could see the D the, the hope is, is that there's just between the offensive line and both coordinators, there's a significant upgrade in, in coaching at those three spots, offense coordinator, defensive coordinator and, and offensive line. Well, to me, there are three reasons for optimism. If, if it's going to be a surprise and in my mind, they're pretty clear cut. One is just experience. On defense, you've got 11 returning starters, and most of those guys have a backup who's played a significant number of snaps. In fact, I was looking. They've had nine defensive backs who've started a game at various points of their career. So that's number one, just the experience factor. Teams just usually get better with more reps and more familiarity. Um, Number two, the coordinators. I just think they have to be better on both sides of the ball, better coach, because look how bad last year was. And the third thing is, like you said, the defensive line. I don't know that there's a star in that bunch for sure, but all of a sudden they have seven or eight guys who on paper appear like they can play at this level. That's what I think James Franklin used to get them turned around when he was here. All of a sudden you could play nine or ten defensive linemen in the league, whereas they hadn't been able to do that before. So I think to me those are three far and away those those are the leaders in terms of three reasons for optimism. Can you give me one that's better than any of those three? No, and I was and and um one thing that and I'm just relaying what he told me. So if you think it's just coach speak, that's fine. This was off the record. Not off I mean, not like I'm saying stuff that he told me not to tell anyone, but I would have conversations with Jason Tarver last year because I'd interview him for on the record for the coordinator interviews and then shut off the recorder and we just talk. He really thought that the defense was going to take a huge jump this year, heading into 2020. Maybe that was just him saying, I know we stink this year. We'll be better next year, more experience. He liked the secondary. He really thought they were in position to take a huge leap forward. So you know, we'll, we'll see if that's the case. Well, sometimes that just happens. And coaching is a variable in it, too, because I don't have it in front of me. But I want to say – between Mason's first and second year, they gave up like 31 points a game his first year. They shaved, what was it, about 10 points off that in year two when he took over. So sometimes that's just the way those things break out. You can look horrible one year and pretty good or respectable the next. Yeah, and, and you know, the stuff like this is so hard in football. It's such an emotional game, and, and we talked about this many times. Like Once the season goes bad, it can spiral out of control. And that's what happened last year. They were just uncompetitive other than the Missouri game. You know, the closest loss was 17 points. So I get why there's very little optimism. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're again, I think the overall talent level isn't much different than a lot of other Vanderbilt teams. Just where is that talent? You know, we, we both agreed that they're lacking the high end talent that some some recent teams have had. It's just the quarterback position is so important. And if you tell me right now that they're not the quarterback play is going to be an issue all season then it's hard to see them being much better on offense um again i think the defense will be better but the offense has to take significant steps forward mitch before we end the podcast i've got a shout out here i've been meaning to do this for two weeks shout out to freedom usa auto sales this is a free plug we were looking for a minivan a couple of weeks ago and had a really good experience there i know Joe Fike, who was the finance guy over there, we talked to, is a big Vandy fan. So uh, shout out to him and Taylor, our sales rep, too. So uh, when you do a good job, you occasionally get a shout out on the podcast, and I wanted to make sure we got that one in. So Mitch, let you have the floor for your own shout out. Tell people what's coming up at The Athletic and where they can find you online and on Twitter. Um, at Twitter, at Mitch Light, and just um... – Nothing too, you know, I've had several stories in the past few weeks, mostly Vanderbilt related on the athletic, nothing really in the hopper right now. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, uh, athletic, great stuff. In fact, I just 
I, I'm multitasking while doing this podcast. I just tweeted out uh, John Hollinger from The Athletic uh, did something about his top 20 NF, uh, NBA draft guys and had some a lot of good things to say about Aaron Neesmith. So you want to hear read his um, recap of Aaron Neesmith there. So a lot of good draft stuff uh, and then just the normal, typical quality work at The Athletic. Great show today. Thanks a bunch, Mitch. All right. Talk to you later, Chris. All right. He's Mitch Light of The Athletic. I'm Chris Lee of VanitySports.com. We may drop one more episode later this week. If not, stay tuned. Next week we'll have more. And thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast.